Dr. Ed Beji became Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer of Novacell when Novacell merged with Cythera and Resident in 2004. Uh, he was recruited before that to Cythera as Chief Scientific Officer in 2001 to head its then emerging human embryonic stem cell program. Novacell is now the first California company to receive funding from the CIRM, and we certainly hope not the last. As you'll hear, uh, the work they're doing with CIRM support holds out tremendous promise for freeing patients with diabetes from these hundreds of thousands of injections. Prior to joining Cythera, Dr. Beche held the position of Chief Scientific Officer at Modex Therapeutics in Lausanne, Switzerland, which developed one of the first adult stem cell products for the treatment of chronic ulcers. And before Modex, he was at Cytotherapeutics in Bristol Myers Squibb. He holds a PhD in molecular neurobiology from Cornell University and completed postdoctoral work also at Cornell and at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. He's published extensively in the field of cell therapy and has produced a number of cell technology patents. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Beche. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And I'd also like to thank uh, Lynn Harwell and Melissa King for coaxing me to come and uh, make this presentation. I think this is a great honor to speak to the CIRM as well as to um, young students who might be interested in getting into stem cells, um, stem cell research in the future of their careers. So what I want to talk to you today about is, is really about this 21st century epidemic and how we as a company have focused our efforts to to develop a treatment, um, a cellular treatment for um, diabetes. Um, we, as you know, it's the sixth leading cause of death in the world, 246 million uh, worldwide with diabetes, 380 million predicted to be worldwide in 2030. The current need really is a safer and improved glucose control as Peter um, so elegantly um, demonstrated for you, we need to be able to keep this glucose level under control. We believe the best way to do that is through the use of replacing the human beta cells that normally do that in the body, just as Peter demonstrated to you. So an islet cell replacement for diabetes, what does that mean? Well, that means that you would need to be able to make, in order to treat the many hundreds of thousands of patients that have diabetes, uh, not only in the US but worldwide and in the millions, um, you would need a, a way to make unlimited numbers of these beta cells. That's number one. Is that possible? The second thing is, is can they be made safe for human use? So not only do you have to grow up very large numbers, hundreds of millions per patient, but you also need to make them safe so that they don't form what are called teratomas, which are benign tumors, which embryonic stem cells do. And then can they be delivered safely without immunosuppression? So because we're making these cells from a single human embryonic stem cell, that cell would be recognized as foreign in any other person that that cell didn't come from. So there needs to be a way to allow the immune system not to destroy the cell. So those are the critical issues with developing this cell therapy. So how did we go about doing this? And I show you on the top here um, a, a simple ball and stick model that takes you from an ES cell and takes you through a series of various steps that basically mimic the normal development. What happens when um, these uh, embryonic cells develop during normal human development? They go through this process of making a, a lineage called endoderm. And that lineage, as shown on the lower part of the slide, is a flat sheet when it's first made. And then it rolls up into a gut tube, which stretches from your mouth all the way to your colon. And off that gut tube, bud, various endodermal organs. Right at the mid foregut junction is where the pancreas buds out and it makes this branching morphogenesis, this epithelium, out into the mesenchyme. And off of that, uh, those epithelial cells, which, which are really the progenitors of the pancreas, come the islets. 
And um, I guess I, sh I can point uh, to those right here. And this is the branching epithelium. So what we're trying to do is take ES cells here and, and direct them. They're just a plate of cells, homogeneous cells, and direct them through a series of steps that mimic this developmental process that occurs during normal human development to make these islet cells. So this is a more complex slide, but just to say we've done a series of studies that were published uh, in 2005, 2006, and 2008, and they're all based on developmental biology. How does the pancreas develop in animals, in fish, in uh, mice, uh, in frogs, and many of the same processes that occur in those lower animals occur during human development. And these processes are conserved during evolution. So we can mimic the process of how do we make ES cells go to definitive endoderm, this lineage that is required for making pancreas. And we've done that through a series of these studies that were published in Nature Biotechnology. They culminated in us coming to the, coming to the conclusion that if we made the pancreatic endoderm, which is the precursor to the pancreas that I showed you on this slide here, this, this structure here, if we made these cells, we could give rise to all the different cell types that are found in the pancreas. Um, but what we did was we skewed the differentiation so that these uh, epithelial cells made primor primarily the islet cells instead of the acinar cells. And as, as Peter Butler told you, um, most of the pancreas is composed of acinar cells that make the digestive enzymes that go into your intestine to digest your food. But only a very small number of the pancreas, pancreatic tissue makes these islets. And so what we want to do is instead of making these cells, we want to make those cells. And that's what we, we succeeded in doing. If we use this procedure here to differentiate these ES cells through these series of steps, and we transplant this material here, which is the progenitor of the pancreas, what we see in the animal after about 80 to 100 days is routinely we see a large uh, production of epithelial-like tissue. And when we stain it for all the markers that are specific for pancreatic islets, for instance, um, showing that they're human, but C-peptide and insulin here, you make these structures that look very much like human islets, and they express all the right genes, um, and for all, purpose, all intents and purposes, morphologically look like islets. But what's really important, and what we couldn't demonstrate in 2006, but we can now demonstrate in 2008, is when you compare them to normal human adult islets shown here, and look at their ability to release C-peptide or insulin into the blood of these animals, they can produce as much C-peptide as 5,000 human islets, which is quite remarkable. Not only can they do that, if you implant these cells into an animal, and you can see here the blood glucose levels of the animals, these sugar levels, you can see we've implanted them with these cells. And over time, you can start to measure the human C-peptide in the animals increasing with time up to 500 picomolar. And then we give this drug that Peter talked about that will, will actually destroy the beta cells and sort of mimic uh, diabetes in, in the animal. And when we do that, the animals remain basically corrected. Their blood glucose levels do not, do not change. Now we explant the graft, so we take the human cells out and, and they become diabetic. So what this proves is that, and we can do this over and over again with these cells, it's very robust. It proves that the human cells are making islets, human islets actually, that make human insulin, and those cells can correct the diabetic condition in an animal. Furthermore, you can look at the glucose tolerance curve. So when you, if you've ever had this test run on you, if, if, if it is suspected you might have the start of diabetes or you do have diabetes where you take glucose, a, a, a strong drink of sugar. And you can do this in animals as well and what happens is their blood sugar levels go way up in the normals. But the animals that have these cells, these human islet cells implanted into them show a very nice response where they start at a, a, a set point that's much closer to human islet cells instead of mouse islet cells 
and they come back down to that set point again after the glucose bolus. And they release very large amounts of insulin, as you can see here. So what's the significance of all this? Well, it's the first demonstration of a human islet um, comparable glucose-stimulated insulin secretion um, and a diabetes animal model cure. I mean, if, uh, basically, there have been many studies claiming and trying to say that we can take a stem cell and turn it into a beta cell. We believe this is the first demonstration of doing this really robustly with human ES cells and making human islet-like cells. It validates the use of these human ES cells for the production of a renewable human islet source and really what our company is focused on, and it's solely focused on this and pretty much has been since its inception, is the, the development of a cell therapy for the treatment of uh, insulin requiring diabetes. So that's where our focus is now. So how do we actually take this very uh, exciting animal work and apply it to a product? Well, one of the really critical things that we have to do is we have to make this product safe for implantation in humans. So the main thing we have to do is find, uh, make sure that we have the functional cells which are depicted in red. There may be accessory cells, other cells that are there, but are, not, are basically um, maybe helpful, but not necessarily bad. Um, and, but the main ones we have to get rid of are these unsafe cells. These are cells that could be remaining ES cells or other progenitor cells that might proliferate uncontrollably. Those are the cells that will form what's called a teratoma, which I'll show you what that looks like in a second. There may also be bystander cells that can be helpful or may not be helpful. What the FDA and the regulatory bodies say, when you're developing a cell therapy, it doesn't have to be 100% pure. There are cell therapies today that are mixtures of cells. What's really important to have control of is an understanding of what those mixtures are and a demonstration that those mixtures are safe. As long as that's demonstrated, you're okay. So basically, one of the principal goals of the company going forward now is to establish a cellular composition of safe and efficacious uh, cells. So here's the example of what happens when it can go wrong. Here are two different um, transplanted animal uh, grafts, one from the right fat pad of an animal, one from the left fat pad. Here's the right fat pad, here's the left fat pad. What you see here are cystic, large cysts and other mesodermal elements along with other islet tissue. And these grafts actually function, yet they have a growth capability that would be problematic in a, in, in, in a patient. So these are the types of cells and growths that you need to control. So how are we going to do that? Well, what we have done um, over the last couple of years is figure out how to actually purify the pancreatic endoderm so that we can enrich it dramatically. And when you do that, and we do, these with, we do this with an antibody sorting methodology, when you do that, you actually make grafts that are very homogeneous and do not grow into these large teratomas. Now, this is early days of doing these purifications, and we've done this multiple times now, and every time that we do it, um, we get graphs that look like this. What we intend to do is be able to use this as a gold standard for actually optimizing our differentiation protocols so that we get this every time, and we think we can do that. They also, these graphs make all the human islet structures that we've seen before, and they are glucose responsive. How are we going to actually deliver these now? So if you can purify them, make them safe, now you need to understand how are you going to put them into the human body such that the immune system does not destroy them. That's the only way you're really going to make a safe product in, in a type 1 diabetic or a type 2 diabetic that requires insulin, because you can't immunosuppress them for life. It just is not something that you could do. So one of the technologies that we have um, in our company is, is one that is, is based on encapsulating the human islet or the human pancreatic epithelial cell in a hydropolymer. It's basically a polyethylene glycol substance that encapsulates and makes a very thin coating around the cluster of cells. This thin coating blocks the immune system and other immu large immune molecules like uh, large antibodies and complement from transient 
transitioning through and, and destroying the human island. And as you know, as Peter pointed out to you, in type 1 diabetes, there are auto-reactive antibodies and auto-reactive T cells that come around and try to destroy those human islets. And so if you just place the human islets into the body, and even if they were your own, and you were type 1, uh, your autoimmunity would come back and destroy that. So you need a way to protect it. And that's one potential way of, of protecting it. And we've tested this in humans already. Um, another way is to use a, a, a device that actually isn't based on a gel, but it's based on a membrane that's non-biodestructible. And so we're exploring not only our technology, but other technologies that have been out there for many years now, but no one had a cell, a renewable cell source to put into them. So if we do this with this technology, we can show you that we can put the PE, this progenitor cell, in and transplant it into animals, and it forms into these functional islet cells, which are glucose responsive. So how, actually, how many of these cells would we need to give to a human being? Well, currently, um, we can show in the, in the laboratory that 5,000 human islets are equivalent to about 1.5 to 3 million of these progenitor cells shown here, which we, we, we believe is the product for treating human diabetes. If you do the math and you say, well, each human being that weighs about 70 kilograms will require about 500,000 of these islets, that's then 100 times that number of cells, which really works out to 150 million to 300 million of these progenitor cells. Now that's very good uh, news because that only represents a volume of, of cellular material of a half an ml to one ml. So that's very, you know, a thousand microliters of cells. It's not a lot of material that we have to put into a product uh, to, to treat a patient. So is a reproducible islet cell replacement for diabetes possible? We say it is. We think you need two major things, one of which we, we think we have a good control or starting to get a good control over now is an HSC-derived renewable pancreatic progenitor, and we believe it needs to be enriched. And then second is an immunoisolation or encapsulation system that doesn't require that you immunosuppress the patient. So if you could summarize what I've said um, in total, you would say from using this picture of developmental biology of how a pancreas develops, the islet cells and the acinar cells develop normally, we have actually recapitulated each one of these steps, first the endoderm, then the pancreatic epithelium, and finally the islet cells after you place these cells in vivo. So it's very gratifying that you can take human embryonic stem cells, and it's quite remarkable that they will do these things in a culture dish and in an animal. So finally, I just leave you with this slide because not only does this allow us to develop a treatment for diabetes, for insulin requiring diabetics, it also allows us to do some very interesting research where we can actually put the human islet tissue into animals and then we can use it as a model to test what happens when you treat the animal with a high fat diet like what happens in many type, type two diabetics, what happens during pregnancy, what happens when you give certain drugs that might actually regenerate the islet cells? And so this becomes a, a universal model of human beta cell biology. So with that, I'd like to you know, close by saying um, it, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have been able to speak with you. And I think with the support of the CIRM and uh, you know, this, this great effort in terms of uh, applying stem cell biology to regenerative medicine, we, we will succeed with this. Thank you.